This is The Sim Pit. I'm your host, Sean Cole, but the real star of today's show is Project Cars. And today I have Andy Tudor, the creative director of Slightly Mad Studios, here to talk about Project Cars. And I'm so excited. Andy, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you guys have been a long time in the making, and uh, the enthusiasm and the buildup just keeps continuing as you guys get nearer and nearer to your... Uh, your newly stated deadline, we'll call it, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, first off, thank you for joining me today. Um, how are you doing? Thanks very much. I obviously need a little bit more coffee than uh, than uh, I, I've got currently. You're, you're hyper at the moment. <laughs> uh, I guess that's my thing. I am always a little hyper. I get excited for these moments. <laughs> you know, uh, this Project Cars has, has teased me personally for a very long time and hopefully get a little insight into what's really behind Project Cars and also um, some of what's created some of the delays and, and how we're looking on that and the future of Project Cars. So yep. um, let's assume that not everybody knows everything about this game or sim. Uh, let's just start off with some real basics. I mean, each sim sort of has their own flavor that makes them unique. Uh, what is it do you think that makes Project Cars unique or special you know, on its own? Well, I mean, the, one of the first things is the way that we've approached creating the game. You know, many games have been made with a very traditional game model of a development model of just kind of making the game in the dark for a few years and then just praying that when the game eventually comes out, it's actually got the features that um, players really want to have in there. And that's like, that's super risky. You know, um, you get tiny little moments when you go to like E3 and Gamescom and the big shows out there where you get feedback on your game and whether what you've actually been creating is what the players and the fans actually want um, but usually unfortunately it's kind of too late to feed that back into the game at that point um, many times you know you can you can make little adjustments here and there but ultimately if you're at a show you're usually you've usually got a version of the game that you're actually quite happy with and you're maybe entering the kind of marketing phase of the of the uh, project um and as i said that's super risky you know so we knew we wanted to include players from day one therefore to kind of mitigate some of that risk and also because we are doing another racing game, it is another sim onto the market. And as you said, there are many other racing games out there. And therefore, we wanted to get a good uh, gauge of um, what players expect from the next racing game, the next sim that they actually come to play. Does it? Do they want features from their favorite game, their favorite racing game? Do they want features that they haven't actually seen before? Um, so having the community involved from day one has like really been kind of one of the unique... Um, kind of features uh from how we've actually made the game and then for those people who weren't involved with the actual game development uh for the last few years you know when they pick up the game off the shelves it will hopefully have a lot of features that they've been wanting from a racing game uh for many years something some of them which the pc sim racing uh, community have had for many years already um and they'll see that it also breaks the mold in a number of different ways, whether that's career or the kind of progression, how you unlock things, you know, um, the feature set, the variety of the cars in there, the sheer scope of the number of tracks, you know, there's a number of different things in there um, from the gameplay side. Um, and then on the technical side, you know, the fact that, you know, it takes advantage of the latest wheels, the latest peripherals, um, 12K, you know, resolution, virtual reality, you know, things that are actually forward facing and very um, kind of make the game uh, built for the future. Wow, what a, what a fantastic answer. And, 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 and we're going to get back to many, many different parts uh, of that. Uh, so going back in time, you talked a lot about the, the cooperation or the conjunction between your community, your crowd and the developers and what you guys. So. How much of this was the vision of Slightly Mad to begin with that was then opinion, you know, put in by the community and changed it? Or was it just always collective from the beginning? I mean, if you look at the journey that we've been on um, over the 10 years that we've been making racing games now, um, it really is a journey, you know, from the old days of GTR and GTR 2 and GT Legends through kind of what we're most known for with the Need for Speed titles and then through to Project Cars. So we had a bold vision. We had this journey that we'd been going on. Um, 
and therefore you know we put out a very simple kind of game outline onto our website onto our wmd portal with a lot of features that we wanted to get to that we hadn't managed to get to in our previous titles things like dynamic weather um, pit stops things like that and a bunch of kind of ideas like um, things that we thought would be really cool or um, specific motorsports we wanted to represent in the game things like that and we put that out to the community and you know this is this is the key thing that we hoped would really kind of motivate the community to come and help us make the game and fund the game um, since that then happened you know we were very lucky you know and kind of overwhelmed to have gotten so much support i think we are the 26th largest crowdfunding title that's ever been made you know there, there were more people signing up for um the wnd portal than there were signing up for xbox one at the uh time xbox live sorry um but then since then it has been a kind of massaging process so the way we kind of think of it is that we knew where we wanted to end up. You know, we knew the um, the destination that we wanted to end at, but the route that we took to that destination has vastly kind of changed here and there um, as we've gone along, and that's th directly through the feedback the community have given us. So, a particular feature that we thought was going to be pretty cool has now been enhanced even further by the community. They've come up with things that we hadn't even thought of ever before. Um, They've talked to us about things that they um, like in their existing games that they love playing and therefore would like to see in Project Cars as well. Um, particular cars they'd like to see, particular tracks, uh, motorsports being represented, um, the way things like unlock uh, in the game. I mean, absolutely everything. Um, physics, feedback on the handling and force feedback, what wheels they're using, what resolution they use on their PCs, for example. Just absolutely everything has been influenced by the community. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, one thing that has always struck me about Project Cars is the graphics, and you, you mentioned you know the, the high-end graphics. I, I know you guys are, are working with Oculus even. Um, how is it, I mean, you guys sort of have gone different approach than everybody else but when i see it there's a different fidelity when it comes to p cars from what i've seen um what was your approach to to doing that i mean it really has a real impact in that in the car feeling uh when driving both visually and sound wise right yeah i mean i mean when we recreate our cars we come at it from the the visual standpoint i mean they have to look absolutely perfectly real you know one we want that to happen anyway on our own end and two we have to get the approval from the actual manufacturers themselves so there's no kind of guesswork here they have to look as real as possible uh, audio wise you know we record the set of the cars under a number of different circumstances and under a number of different um uh think scenarios that are done um and then the feeling of the car it has each car has to feel different to the last one that you played um so that there's variety in there and so they're true to life um so when it comes to the graphics particularly i mean computers are really good at rendering things that cars are made out of so they're really good at you know rendering metals and uh, glass you know reflections and things like that and they're getting better now at rendering things that are soft you know soft body uh, physics and things like that uh, and, and fluid dynamics things like that now so um if you look at our previous games again like we're on this constant kind of journey towards photorealism and with the power of like the xbox one and the playstation 4 and certainly with like the new nvidia cards and things like that nowadays and the power of pc the average pc that the player has in their own home um it's a lot easier um power wise performance wise to get closer to that photoreal um value um whilst also retaining like a really fr high f uh, frame rate but on the flip side of that, everyone has that now. You know, everyone has really good looking graphics. Um, so therefore, you know, that's where our kind of hashtag of beyond reality has kind of come from. But it's not just about the graphics. It is about the sound as well. It's also about the gameplay. It's also about taking advantage of like new technologies, like you said, like Oculus VR and uh, the Sony Project Morpheus. Um, it's about, you know, not ju just using one 4K TV, but using three 4K TVs together um and being able to play like locally like on a um nvidia shield or something like that so 
yeah it's it's all about like the experience of reality you know and trying to convey the g-forces and all the kind of things that you do um feel in a real car um to both the players who are sat there on their couch with a dualshock 4 compared to the guys who have a dedicated sim rig at home you know with a, a um a dedicated uh, seat triple screens wheels shifters all that kind of stuff to convince both sets of players that what you're playing is as close to reality as you'll you're, you're likely to get sure and and how hard is it to to make that gap where you're coming from a gamer playing on the xbox one maybe with a control pad up to like you said a guy in a dedicated rig with triple screens and a pc with you know three video cards if need be um right. you know how, how do you make a, a a gamer sim that that really bridges that entire gap well i mean you know, uh, on our previous games, we've, we we were transitioning um, with the Need for Speed guys. You know, we were, we were transitioning a audience who were um, used to kind of illegal street racing and things like that and escaping the cops and things. And then we were gradually introducing more sim-like qualities and kind of starting to move away from like more arcade kind of um, handling, more arcade kind of like gameplay mechanics, things like that. But with project cars we've started right at the other end of the racing spectrum so you know you know i racing r factor all that kind of stuff and then including what we've learned from our need for speed uh, products um, by making them more accessible to players so from the gameplay you know from the experience um, um, hand um, standpoint you know it is a very firmly uh, simulation racing game but is more accessible to players who just want to, you know, turn off, turn on all the driving aids, turn on the best line, um, have a uh, a more casual handling mode, um, you know, have reduced or um, uh, reduced impact of like uh, flags and penalties, things like that. And then on the tech side, we have a, you know, we have our own engine. It's the Madness engine, and it is scalable to every kind of um, um, bit, bit of hardware that you've got in the actual machine. So you can play project cars on your PC, desktop, dedicated machine. You can play it on your laptop as well. You can play it on Xbox One and the consoles. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a little bit of um, foreshadowing and a little bit of um, foresight that we've had at the start of the project that has really kind of helped us now along with our experience of uh of making games for a very long time now awesome and it really i mean in my opinion it has you guys going back closer to your original roots of games like gtr gtr2 gt legends um and like you said kind of a a, a shift away from the arcade type titles um no pun intended though, right? <laughs> no none at all uh all right um now, when you guys have also chosen to do some real-life tracks and some fantasy tracks, which personally I think is awesome, is was that always your intention all along? And what's the difference between uh, when you're approaching making the, uh, those types of tracks? I mean, a real track, it's real. You have to be exact and precise. A fantasy track has to feel real and precise, but you don't have much to go with i'm uh, what's the difference in the process in making the two um i mean so for a start i mean we try to get as many real life licenses as possible and we've still got some that are unannounced so we have to check our website you know in the in the upcoming weeks to uh to kind of uh, see what those final reveals are and uh, get the full track list um but, you know, in the meantime, you know, we try to get as many licenses as possible. You know, we've, as I say, we've been making racing games for a long time. So we have good um, relationships with those, um, you know, license holders and stuff. Um, and when we do that, you know, it's a case of either laser scanning those particular tracks, um, certainly taking like gigabytes, probably terabytes of data, you know, um, um, visual data. Um Watching, you know, actual videos of real life drivers out there on the uh, on the circuit, um, you know, just t getting as much information as possible to get those absolutely, you know, correct uh, driving them in real life ourselves, potentially as well to uh, ensure that everyone has a good sense of the scariness that you feel of the elevation changes at um, Nordschleife, for example, compared to something which is a, a lot more flat um, in real life, like Silverstone. 
so yeah that's that you know when it comes to licensed tracks yeah you're absolutely right you have to basically get it as as close to reality as possible you know and as up to date as possible as well you know and that's where our real life drivers kind of come in handy as well you know they've probably just visited um those tracks uh, literally last weekend for some uh you know um uh, an FIA event or something, you know, uh, an endurance event, uh, some touring car event. So they can give us like really, you know, the minutiae that you uh, kind of get to understand from their racing experience and rather than just the spectator experience. You know, they tell you about where um, water, you know, kind of starts to build up around the track, um, where it dries quicker than others, where, you know, tyre rubber generally kind of starts to build up, things like that. The latest rumble uh, strip uh, colours and things like that, for where they've just updated the um, uh, the uh, location as well. So, yeah, you know, the, when it comes to real life tracks, you know, we, we, we think they're like really important for players because they are, you know, they are they've seen them on the tv and they've visited them in, in real life and when it comes to the fantasy tracks um the fantasy tracks are kind of um our own interpretations of best bits and the best moments of racing um from our own experiences and from other tracks you know some tracks you, that are fantasy tracks may actually be kind of jigsaw pieces of other you know famous tracks that uh, uh, uh that are around so particular hairpins or particular straights with a um an, an elevation or a, a bridge to kind of go um to go over or you know we we kind of um interpret those as and create those as best we can um to recreate something that is like really fast you know something that uh is exciting to play has uh, great moments of um high speed great moments of um um you know slowing down for um very difficult corners um you know really tough to master um but equally like really really fun if you get like a nice smooth curve around it sure for a guy like me it's like that's been my dream to drive uh, exotic cars on the pacific coast highway so to speak so when you guys began all of this this is going to be pc xbox 360 PC, uh, ps3 and obviously a lot of time has gone by technology is advanced now we're on the xbox one the ps4 so I mean, I'm assuming that was a big part of uh, a change for you guys. I mean, that was, is that a big change in development when you're switching from consoles like that? Uh, and, and did that open up new abilities? I mean, is, is it that much more powerful of a system when you can use those as your basis? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, um, it wasn't a quick decision to make. You know, we thought about it for a long time and there were pros and cons um but ultimately it's it was a it was the right decision to make not only from you know when the game's released you know you go into a store right now like xbox one and playstation 4 games have far more shelf visibility than any other um uh, platform so you know with again a bit of foresight you know we hope that that would be the case and certainly when we saw that the playstation 4 was um taking off so well and being so um, um, enamored by uh, by uh, consumers that, um, yeah, it was definitely the right decision on that front. Um, Technology-wise, yes, they're more powerful and things, so we can actually push them more and therefore make the console versions as um, close to our vision for, like, the game um, as, as possible without having to make sacrifices. Um, and then finally, you know, the new consoles have, you know, unique new features that we can take advantage of, you know, certainly in terms of um, taking screenshots, um, 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 uh, streaming, um, things like that, um, sharing your experience with other people. Um, so yeah, it was kind of threefold, the the kind of direction and the, the reason for moving to the new consoles, and um, certainly it was the right one. Cool, cool. And and yeah, I think in the end it ends up being a better quality product and, and also we're at that point in time now where this is the, the next gen. It's not even a matter of it being around the corner. It's here. It's in most people's living rooms. Um, Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the delays. I mean, what, I mean, I, for me, it's like I do a show for a living. I don't build a sim, but I play them and, and, and I can look and see all the intricate details that it takes to make. And I think that most games or sims that come out in the modern era come out almost incomplete in need of patches and things to fix them. So obviously some other sims that have seen the day of light early probably shouldn't have. Um, so I can't even fathom what's behind, but what, when it comes to making delays on things, 
what what's at the heart of things like that what what is it a problem thing or is it a perfection thing is it a licensing thing um i mean usually it's a perfection thing as you say you know um it's not just limited to sims you know there's been a recent spat of games that have come out um with either game crippling bugs um some features not working for example um and it doesn't help anybody you know having those games out you know um if somebody asks me kind of what I do, you know, and you say you make games, people are like, oh, that's cool. And uh, then what game are you working on? And you tell them, and then you, they say, how long have you been working on it for? And, and you say three to four years, and they go, wow. They don't kind of realize how long it takes to make games. It's it's like making a film, you know, you have to do your pre-production, hire actors, get a script, all that kind of stuff, shoot it all, then do all the special effects afterwards, music, blah, 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 finally get into the cinemas. Um, and as we've seen, you know, the... Marvel movies like Captain America 3 and um, Captain Marvel and Thor 3 and things like that, they're moved as well, you know, to make way for other movies and things. Um, so, yeah, you know, you, d you never want to kind of delay um, anything. And certainly you don't want to kind of disappoint people. You know, it's heartbreaking to see people on Twitter going, oh, it's my birthday that day and I've taken the day off work to, to play your game. And you're like, oh, that's really cool. And then, like, you have to move the date and you feel sorry for like those guys and things like that and it so it's not like it's not something we take glee in and things it's not something we're deliberately teasing people with you know moving the date you know at the end of the day it comes down to the final quality of the product that we've been working on for a long time and the team want to kind of put a product out there that they're really proud of um and then you know we've also we've got the community involved as well you know and if the community are saying you know there's something you know this little thing here is fixed or actually there's a little bug if you press that button then this and this then it you know something happens you know so ultimately it's in everyone's best interest that our own franchise, this new IP that we're creating with Project Cars, something which is, was built from day one to be completely future-proof. We want you to be playing like long into the future. It's in everyone's best interest that that game launches with a bang and is something that everyone's really proud of. It works exactly as we wanted it to. It's up to the kind of visual gameplay standard, you know, that uh, we all have and all hope for the project. Um, it sells well, is critically acclaimed, and that sets us up really, really well for the future. And if that unfortunately has meant moving the release date forward by one month, then you know we're, we're extremely sorry, and we're you know <laughs> from the bottom of from the bottom of my heart, you know, and from the team's heart, you know, we appreciate everyone kind of hanging by with us, you know, and stuff, you know, and I hope that our um, announcement of the free cars that you'll be receiving every month is kind of shows our appreciation for that um, into the future. Awesome, awesome. And, and uh, yeah, of course, you guys aren't delaying uh, to tease people or do anything on that level. Um, I, I'm glad, though, because, again, like you've said, there's, you see stories about this all the time, but some games that are coming out almost unplayable. Uh, and and there, I hate to call it a trend, but I can think of a few titles that have had this problem fairly recently. So, I mean, I would always rather get something that's ready to go. Now, you said Future Proof. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, with GTR, there was GTR 2. Uh, with Shift, there was Shift 2. Um, <laughs> a lot of games in the old school model were version 1, version 2. You repackage it, rebundle it, sell it again. Uh, a lot of games now are depending on DLC uh, to, to get sort of a, a income coming into the game. Uh, and then you even have the hybrids like a Forza that sort of does both. It's like they, they rebrand it every two years, but they sell you D uh, DLC for 24 months. Um, right. But all that is the future of all these lines of, of games or sims. For Project Cars, do you guys know the future? Do you know how you're going to move forward and, and continue forever, uh, so to speak? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, we've got it. We've had a plan for a while now, and and it's a plan that is in action. Uh, you can see that with the uh, the free car um, um, uh, announcement. That you know, this is something we have planned. This is something we want to say thank you for uh, you guys for waiting, and it is how we're going to you know, um, give you kind of new stuff every month. Um, that's just kind of part one of that plan. Um, and yeah, you know, as, as you can see with how we've been making the game, you know, the, the, the way we've been making the game has been very kind of organic in that, you know, every 
patch that you download, every update that you get to the game, every new version of it, you get something new, whether that is a fix for something or a new car or a new track, even if it's in like a kind of beta form or something like that, you get to actually go and race that track, give feedback on it, uh, a new feature, an enhancement to an existing feature, some new uh, usability, uh, you know, in the game. Um, and so therefore that feels very much like how modern day RPGs actually um, get updated after launch. You know, if you if you're playing Eve Online or Star Trek Online or League of Legends or something like that, you know, it's it's regularly updated with feedback, fixes, nerfs, bug, you know, um, um, things like that, um, new champions to play, all that kind of stuff. Um, over time, and it helps the game feel fresh, keeps it contemporary, keeps it relevant, and keeps you kind of going back to the game as well to see what's new there as well. So the traditional model of, well, the very traditional model of releasing a game and then moving on to the next is, I mean, those days are, days, those days are, got, are long gone. Um, but then the equally, the last kind of generation's um, way of dealing with that with, you know, your standard like three packs of DLC and then you move on and then you go on to your next game. Again, those kind of days are starting to um, wane as well, as you said, with the previous games you mentioned there. So, you know, there are more games that are becoming services, uh, more games that are kind of taking this idea of constant updates, um, um, whether that is you know brand new content to play or new ways to play the game or updates and fixes for you know something in the existing game already um, and that's certainly how I mean if you take a probably the most closest example is like destiny um, which is great core game and things but right up front they said look you're gonna get brand new stuff at regular intervals which is going to keep the game you're going to be playing the game for the next 10 years you know we're not saying 10 years you know i don't even <laughs> think that the, the, i don't even think the destiny guys believe in 10 years but you know we'll see um but yeah the idea that project cars is the core game and then you will be playing brand new stuff on regular intervals and that will consist of many different types of things whether that's new cars or tracks or you know whatever game features whatever um yeah, I mean, that's the way to kind of think of um, how we're approaching how Project Cars is going to expand in the future. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and will, I mean, are all three, I mean, forget, like, graphics, obviously, if I have a super PC and triples, that's different. But the, the core of the game, is it the same across all three platforms? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, um, so again, kind of breaking the fourth wall here, like, we don't, we don't make the PC version and then port it to the consoles. You know, um, I don't know whether kind of other companies do that. I'm sure they do. Um, but no, our, our our strategy, our development process that is that we make all three or four or five or six, whatever, however many platforms um, the game's ultimately going to be released on, we make them simultaneously. So when a PC build is made, an Xbox One version is made and a PlayStation 4 version is made as well. So, you know, with that idea, it means that we can get parity between all the different platforms um, at the same time. Now, I mean, of course, there are going to be micro differences between um, some platforms based off the actual things that are allowed on those platforms. Um, so, yeah, there are kind of tiny, tiny differences. But certainly, you know, we've been seeing on like Twitter and social media, people have been saying, oh, can I uh, remap my buttons on Xbox One? And we're like, yeah, of course you can. It seems <laughs> silly to us to even ask that kind of thing. Yeah, of course you can. Can I move my seat forward and backwards on PlayStation 4? Well, yeah, we're not going to. We're not going to dumb it down for the console um, generation. You know, if you want to do that, then yes, absolutely. It is there for you. And again, that goes back to what I was saying, that some of these things are things that haven't been in console games, in console racing games for a while, but the PC sim racing community have had that kind of stuff for a long time. Sure. Um, well, well, so it's in everyone's best interest to have them all the same. Absolutely. And, and I, I, like you said, I don't know if they all port or how their other the other companies' approaches are, but... There, there often has been a pretty substantial difference where the, 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 the PC version really didn't feel like a PC game. It felt like a, a, a console game being played on the PC. Right. And, and yeah, because cause if we do console going to the PC, then the PC owners will always say, oh, it's a simcade. It's, a, it's an arcade wanting to be a sim. Right. But if you're going from the other direction, which is, as I said earlier, you know, we've started at the 
very end of the racing spectrum and brought all our, our experience from the consoles to that, then it's a very different kettle of fish. You know, you are starting with a, a, a sim racing title and then making it more accessible to people on the consoles whilst keeping the same experience for everyone. And then we've given you all the controls you need to dial it to what you want, you know, so when you load the game up, the very first thing it's going to say is, where are you on that spectrum? Are you a a more of a veteran kind of racer who likes it in kind of hardcore, hardcore mode, you know, with no driving assists, the, the most professional handling model, um, nothing on screen, you know, no hood or anything like that. Um, and are you using a wheel, all that kind of stuff compared to, are you the kind of player who is used to playing, you know, um, other racing games on consoles um, and therefore would like a little bit of assistance here and there, or are you kind of in the middle, which is, you know, what we would think, what we would uh, say is, are, have you played Forza and Gran Turismo before? And therefore, choose this one if you do, but we're going to encourage you to actually move to this one, this uh, further end of the spectrum now because of uh, the, the complexity and the depth of the physics and stuff in there. Right, right. Um, well, I think, I, again, the whole approach to me... So let's talk a little about the career mode, which when I think career mode, I think of that being a single-player game for the most part. Right. That's something that's kind of rare on the PC side, unless it really is one of those arcade games coming over to the PC. Uh, for the guys who are coming from the PC Sims, this is going to be kind of a new twist or a new entertainment. Um, do you guys have a storyline type thing like I've seen in other games you've produced? Is it just sort of like different levels of achievements? I mean, how, do, how does your career mode play along? So career mode... Um, like all the other things in the game, has been influenced by um, the word authenticity. So when you go into career mode, you know, cr traditionally in games, you start at the bottom in a very slow car and then you grind through the races to either unlock new types of car or new motorsports to play. Um, you're basically grinding for kind of cash and xp experience points and things to upgrade your cars or ultimately buy one that you do actually want to drive you know the, maybe the, the one that's actually on the cover of the box um and that's kind of something that very common we've all done before and we're all a bit sick of <laughs> you know so you know when 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 you're talking about like what makes project cars unique it's it's those kind of ideas it's it's taking a step back at what people usually do you know, uh, looking at kind of the way people play games nowadays, you know, we're all of a similar kind of age, I would say. We've all kind of grown up playing racing games many times. We've done that experience already, and now we want something different and new to do. You know, there's a new generation of gamers out there who are playing games which are more experiences rather than a kind of a linear progression, you know, uh, games which are very much sandboxes, you know, like Minecraft and things like that. And therefore, they want to be able to dip in and out of experiences whenever they want um, before moving on to other things that distract us in our life, like Twitter and Facebook and television and Netflix and all that kind of stuff. You know, things we didn't have years ago when we would maybe spend a bit more time sat in front of the computer or the console playing a game. Um, so, yeah, you know, so career mode is, in, is influenced directly by, you know, the drivers that we have on board um, and the concept of breaking from tradition, breaking those traditional tropes of video games, um, and listening to the community on how they want to kind of uh, progress through their career. So the career mode should feel very much like something you might have seen in a sports franchise game. So something like FIFA or Madden or Tiger Woods or NBA or something like that. Because the concept of the driver is that they are an athlete. You know, they they train, they practice, they get the best equipment, um, they go into qualifying on the on the day prior, and then they go into the actual event. You know, the next day, they're climbing leaderboards, they are getting sponsorship deals and things like that. You know, they are they are channeling the you know that direction that they go in their career. Um, 
towards you know the pinnacle of, of what they of, of whatever motorsport they want to uh, go to you know you hear many drivers starting in karting and then you know maybe going into kind of some kind of sort of early gt or early touring class um, like Ginettas, you know that feeds into btcc um or they start in like formula ford and then work their way into formula two formula one um etc so um yeah, many of the drivers that we know and love in real life have have these experiences, have have this career path that they've gone through from an early age up until where they are right now. And the career mode in Project Cars um, allows you to recreate that. So we looked at, we kind of identified three historic goals that had been created, um, um, had been earned by um, kind of racing legends out there. Um, and, you know, we treat those as kind of multiple endings to the game. So if you do want to do, you know, what we call the zero to hero historic goal, where you you start in carts, you work your way through the tiers and, um, you know, you sign contracts for different teams who are who have been impressed by your success and behavior in previous uh, in a previous um, tier, uh-huh. you know, you'll then um, then, yeah, you can work your way all the way up to the to the Le Mans prototypes and uh, participate in the uh, 24 hours of Le Mans. Um, if, however, you are someone who knows what they like already, you know that you love Formula One, or you know that you love GT1 or something like that, you can jump into the game and you get to choose your starting point, and you can choose GT1 as your starting point right there. And you can be someone like Michael Schumacher, who is just continually defending the same championship year after year, just proving their dominance in that motorsport, uh-huh. you know, and, and becoming a racing legend like that. Fantastic. And then... And then the final one is what we call a triple crown. And that's for people who don't really know what they want, you know, in the game. You know, this is somebody who is like uh, Travis Pastrana, who has been a master of many different disciplines, you know, whether that is rallycross or or whatever, you know, he's moved around quite a lot and shown that he's um, successful in many different motorsports. And so the triple crown is kind of, you know, allows you to to recreate his career in there. So yeah, career mode has been definitely inspired by the real life drivers. Um, it allows freedom to choose where you want to start and where you want to end up, and it allows you to kind of participate and think of all the things that real drivers do. You know, so if you do well in a particular round or a particular series or championship or season, then you're going to get noticed by people either surrounding you like agents and scouts from other teams or you're going to get you know um um approached by other teams from a higher tier higher motorsport who are impressed by your success and actually want to take you on um so you can actually climb the ladder instead so yeah it's been it's a different approach but it is something that has been done in other genres and we always like kind of looking at other genres um out there um for inspiration on how to kind of like keep innovating and keep um, the racing genre kind of new and fresh. Uh, I, I love that too. And it's something that in the world of motorsport games has always sort of lacked, especially when you look at the high end, uh, uh, you know, sim type games versus the arcade type game. So, uh, you know, and, and not everybody's looking for the super serious league race every night. Sometimes we just want to have some fun. Sometimes we want to just play it out. Sometimes we don't want to mingle with others. Um, okay, let's switch, though, and talk about multiplayer. Obviously, multiplayer and racing against other humans is a big deal. Um, right. How How is the multiplayer? Is it really league-friendly? Um, what, are, what are people going to find when they go to the multiplayer experience at P-Cars? Well, I mean, there's, so there's two ways. Um, there's two ways of playing with others. You know, the first is based around the community and the idea of playing asynchronously against each other and sharing your experience and doing things like that. So, I mean, the first, I mean, we're on different time zones ourselves. You know, so the chances of us being online at the same time are quite slim, I would say. But even still, I would like to see kind of your lap times and you know try to beat you and you know therefore you then try to beat me back you know and that is something we've learned is extremely motivational extremely compelling from our need for speed titles with uh, autolog and so that's where the drive the concept of the driver network came came from which is a way for you to play you know um, leaderboard based play so time trials 
and to be able to download ghosts of each other, you know, and play against them. Um, not just your friends, but absolutely anybody on the leaderboard. So um, when we've been to kind of real life events and things like that, you know, I, I went to, I went karting with Ollie Webb and Nicholas Hamilton and, you know, they're professional drivers. And even in these little carts, they were taking different lines to, you know, the rest of us who are just, you know, um, you know, but, um, uh, just casual people. Oh. Right. <laughs> um, and, um, the lines that they took were faster. Of course they are because they know what they're doing. Yeah. And therefore everyone else started taking their lines as well and therefore got faster and faster throughout the day. So you can't underestimate the advantage of downloading a ghost of somebody who knows exactly what they're doing, who is really fast, who is the top of the leaderboard and using that as a training tool to help you get faster or downloading the ghost of your friend and seeing how the heck did he actually do that, you know, mm -hmm. and being able to like compete directly against him, even though you're not actually online together at the same time. Mm -hmm. So driver network time trial with downloadable ghosts is like one of the first ones, you know, that's, it's, it's great. You know, it's a really compelling uh, feature. Um, the next is um, community events. So, you know, as going back to the idea of how, Project Cars is going to keep fresh and contemporary and, and different every time you log on. You know, these are going to be things that you um, reflect real life events. So we'll have kind of more information on this when we release the schedule um, on our Facebook page. But, you know, if the Spa 24 hour or the Dubai 24 hour is happening in real life, you'll be able to recreate the same event in Project Cars that particular weekend, for example. Um, there may be events based off. Um, particular holidays you know it's like a halloween special uh -huh. you know which is a night a night time in the rain something really scary or something like that um or other events that you know showcase particular cars or particular tracks and things like that um sometimes there'll even be real world prizes for these things as well so during development we tested this out um and gave away you know um everything from mugs through to uh you know wheels and shifters and things like that and uh, game pads and headsets and things like that so we hope that that is, again, some, going to be something that, you know, you're going to log on to Project Cars, you're going to see what's out that particular week or month or something like that and participate them in them. And, you know, and hopefully if you do really well, then you're going to uh, then you're going to win something cool. Um, but then, like, let's move into, like, you know, competitive multiplayer. So both of those things are kind of asynchronous. So you don't need to play against other people. You're playing solo, but with either ghosts or times to kind of beat of other people but versus multiplayer is different you know that is where you are finding lobbies of um your friends you're looking at uh, a lobby list and seeing which one you want to go into which uh, suits your particular car or track choice you're creating your own lobbies either against um so we've split it out here again like listening to how the community um uh, play um, and using our own kind of uh, knowledge of how our previous games have played, um, how players like playing online as well. So we've split it out into three different ways. So you can either play with strangers. So this is the equivalent of just going uh, quick race, just find me any old game. You know, it's going to be against people from all the way around the world. Like uh, I can kind of filter by a car or a track or whatever uh, type, but really I'm playing against complete strangers. And therefore, when you go into a lobby, the lobby has an automatic countdown because we don't want to give a particular host like all the power because, you know, they can be idiots, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and, that, you know, and you're there constantly waiting for them to start the game and all that kind of stuff. And they change the car list at the last minute and all that kind of stuff. We don't want that. Yeah. We want a nice, clean experience. You find a game, you go in there, there's a countdown. Everyone goes into the game straight away. Um, the next, that is very different, though, to how you play with your friends. When you play with your friends, hopefully you trust each other. And therefore, you know, whoever starts the lobby is going to be somebody that you are. You don't mind having the power of, you know, actively selecting the, the track list, actively selecting what sessions you want pre-race, whether that's uh, warm up qualifying uh, practice uh, sessions, um, setting particularly uh, particular um, restrictions so whether you want to force people to manual gears or whether you want to force damage and tire wear and fuel use and all that kind of stuff on um, and there's no countdown there because you know 
you're you're probably talking with each other either by voice chat or text chat or something you know so you're you you know you're communicating naturally with that and therefore you can say look you know Sean we're all, we're all ready now like let's go um and then you all go into the uh, event yourself um and then the third type is kind of meant for those guys or those um companies or organizations and things who want to allow you entry to a particular event on particular days by invitation only yeah so you could have a simpit um event uh, and you can run your own competition on your website to um, work out who are going to be the competitors for that particular um, event and you can then invite those members only into the event itself as well oh, fantastic. so you know yeah so this is meant for you know you guys you know like the guys who like like to take it quite seriously like to have very scheduled organized events things like that um and the events are only for people or who match certain criteria of whatever you decide um and uh yeah then you know beyond that you know we've then added in things like being able to join uh, mid-session so if you uh, have one of your friends who is always late, you can say, you know, OK, guys, we're going to race at seven o'clock, but there will be a practice session before that. And you can turn up at any time before that, uh, before that seven o'clock deadline, um, maybe get a few laps in to kind of reacquaint yourself with the track, things like that. And um, and then all race together uh, when seven o'clock hits. Um, we've got we've added in game chat. So, you know, although it is quite tricky to actually type or something like that whilst you're actually driving um whilst you're in the pits of course you you know you can talk to other drivers um we've got a monitor system which allows you to watch the actual race via kind of either broadcast or onboard cameras um there's an in-game lobby as well so you can just like naturally just sit there and talk to people too um you know we've really kind of gone overboard with like looking at how people play looking at other games that there are out there um looking at kind of the future and where we want project cars to go in terms of being, people being able to play online and then potentially people spectate those games um so yeah we've really kind of like taken the community on board um with the, the multiplayer features wow it sounds like there's very few stones that you guys haven't turned over in, uh, in planning <laughs> and building this um when you mentioned some of the time trial and beating your friends i'm assuming i have a friends list so there are people that that the game acknowledges as my friends and foes, so to speak. Um, I loved and shift when the auto log would come in um, and, and just randomly tell me something that I got beat by somebody on my list. And I always found that to be a huge motivating force in bringing me back to a certain car and track combo because somebody I knew had bettered my time. Um, and again, it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is sort of pulling the best parts from both worlds and putting them together because let's face it to me it seems like the arcade world always needed to be a little more serious and the sim world needed to be a little bit more fun um <laughs> yeah i mean like if you, so if you look at our driver network feature um the driver network has you know it keeps track of like a lot of your stats you know but intrinsically stats are sometimes you know quite boring to look at you know it's percentages and you know things like that and how many hours you've logged and things like that but actually you know we've seen that infographics and things like that can make stats like really really interesting you know so something that is actually quite dry can actually be reinterpreted in a more fun easy to understand manner without making it dumbed down mm -hmm. um so yeah certainly like you're right in that in that respect um and then you know you know, your gallery of um you know your photos and replays things like that you know uh, we were talking about how the new consoles have allowed us to do more with them um and, you know and when it comes to you know how you share your photos and replays things like that there are just a million ways nowadays you know on pc you can you've got your steam screenshot gallery you know you can stream via twitch uh you can upload to youtube um you know if you if you go to our Flickr gallery you know we've started curating like the best pictures that people have taken with the in-game photo mode um kind of already there's a million like videos on youtube of like bits of gameplay here and there comparisons with real life all that kind of stuff so you know the driver network is really you know um a way for you to 
compete, you know, uh, and share your experience with others. Very cool. Um, so you guys are uh, May 15th. Is that now the, the scheduled release date? So there are various places on the web with all different dates. We haven't given a specific date out there other than May. Okay. Um, so that's – but that's coming pretty quickly. Are, are you guys holding it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, that's so quick that at this point you'd be telling me now that there's going to be a delay if you weren't going to make May because you'd pretty much uh, – but um, – is when I, you know, I did a piece a while ago talking about misconceptions or breaking uh, the preconceived notions that people have about certain groups or, or companies. Um, do you think that as Slightly Mad and with your previous lineage, do you think that there's any beliefs people have or things that you constantly hear from people that you're like, why are you so absurd? We don't do that anymore. Or this is what we're really all about. Um <laughs> It, it, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, you know, without putting words in my mouth, you know, I would, I would, I would probably say that, you know, we, we people know us from the GT, people either know us from the GTR and GT Legends, GTR two days, or they know us from the Need for Speed titles. So there are probably two different factions of people who have wildly different, you know, views um, of the company and things like that. Um, but I mean, you know, I think. There might be a few people out there who probably think that just because the project cars is on the consoles that the game has been dumbed down in, in some way and that's absolutely not the truth at all you know we've got one of the most advanced physics engines of all time out there you know it is graphically beautiful it is completely authentic to you know uh to real life based off all the input that we've had from gamers and and press and real life drivers things like that so um yeah, it's. I'm, I'm sure there are wildly different views out there, but um, you've 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 just got to kind of look at the game itself and take um, take uh, take that as the uh, the the point of reference. You know, we can't. We've been making the game for like three to four years now, and you know, everyone's had their input on the game. We haven't hidden ever anything from from um, the public. You know, we've been making the game in like a goldfish bowl, as it were, with everyone being able to look in and see what's going on and things like that from, from day one. Uh, you know, so we can't hide, you know, we're not going to make screenshots that like are actually kind of uh, renders or like they've been, they've gone through a marketing department and, you know, made them fancier than they actually are. You know, we've let the community just do that all for us and stuff. Um, and ultimately, you know, if it has the community approval, which it does now, and if the racing, real racing drivers are using it as um, practice for the real life thing, then surely the proof is in the pudding right there that, you know, the game that we've been making is something that is, uh, everyone's been looking forward to everyone's been hoping for and yeah you know when it comes out is gonna be the game that they've, they've uh they really want to uh play far into the future excellent excellent um is there any uh, you you mentioned you guys still have a few announcements coming between now and release date uh is there anything we don't know about the 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 sim that we should any game anything inside that people just don't think of to ask plenty <laughs> there's, there's plenty <laughs> There's, I think there's a. I know you're trying to look for an exclusive here. <laughs> there's um, yeah. There's the. I mean, there's only a few short weeks left, as you were saying. Um, and we have, as I said, like we've got a few more tracks to announce. We've got um, I, I, when I look at my screen here, the actual list is just below here, so <laughs> I can't uh, um, I can't I can't give it away. But yeah, we've got a few more things um there. You know, um, you saw like the recent um. Fanatec wheel support that we put into the game. Yeah. You know, and that, you know, hopefully, you know, that came out of nowhere and like really surprised um, a bunch of people. So, yeah, we've got, we've got a bunch of uh, more things to kind of come down the pipeline that we hope, you know, people are going to be really excited for and really thankful for. Yeah. Your list of supported wheels is, I mean, it's pretty much any wheel I can think of. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh... Yeah. I mean, you know, we did, we've, we did a poll early on of like what are the most, the most used wheels out there you know um if you've got a wheel generally you're probably more tech savvy anyway and more more likely to spend money on uh to keep your hardware kind of upgraded um so those were the kind of the first ones that we um approached to get support in for and certainly we had support for many wheels in our previous games as well um 
and then yeah you know the manufacturers come along with their, their new products or um, some more support from from their end in terms of the SDKs for uh, to how to get their wheels working uh, with the game so uh, yeah you know we the wheel and steering uh, the, um, and pedals and shifters they are the the, the most natural input device for a racing game you know for a driving game you know we've we all see them in cars from a from being babies mm-hmm. so we're all aware of what they are and therefore have a kind of in, inert um innate sorry um idea of like how they work and stuff like that and so when you sit down in front of a racing game you kind of already know kind of what to do and stuff so yeah racing wheels and uh, peripherals are like extremely important for us excellent like I said at the beginning, this is something that I've just been licking my chops, trying to get at, and uh, really looking forward to. I, I like your guys' approach. Um, you know, everything you've said today just kind of confirms a lot of what I believed in, in Project Cars, that it was a, a unique uh, game or sim, uh, which, which, is, which is really special to me. It, it just opens our world to a bigger community when we have such a unique different type of a game it's just a whole other direction and, and i appreciate that so andy I, I i thank you for coming here today or being here today and i thank you for uh you know telling us so much about the inner workings of p cars and uh yeah thank you very much thanks it's been a pleasure all right well you sit there a moment and i'll just sign off <laughs> This is Sean Cole with Andy Tudor of Slightly Mad Studios for Project Cars. We're only a couple months away from this sim game being available on just about every platform you can imagine or that you'd want to play. Support for everything and it's going to have new direction and flavor that honestly you haven't seen in a what I'm going to call a PC sim before. So this is The Sim Pit. I'm Sean Cole and I'll see you on the track. <laughs>